Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the last afternoon of this wonderful conference. Uh, my name is Margaret Beyer. I'm an associate professor of industrial organizational psychology here at Rice. That is psychology as applied to work. And so I've been really um, gratified to see such multidisciplinary work here at the conference. Congratulations, Moshe. It's been a great experience. I was also on the uh, planning committee for this conference. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, John Seely Brown, or JSB, as I've been invited to call him. Um, JSB is a true Renaissance thinker uh, who is a scientist, a designer, and a strategist. His research examines organizational culture, strategy, and technology in human contexts. He is currently an advisor to the provost at the University of Southern California and a co-chairman of the Deloitte Center for the Edge. In a previous life, he was the chief scientist of Xerox Corporation and the director of its Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC, of which you may have heard, um, where he spent two decades. He helped transform PARC into a multidisciplinary research center, one that integrated design and the arts, social sciences, cultural anthropology, philosophy, and technology. He received his BA from Brown University and his PhD from the University of Michigan in computer and communication scientists. He is the author of over 100 articles, papers, chapters, and numerous books, including his latest, The New Culture of Learning, co-authored with Doug Thomas. He is a member and fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences the National Academy of Education, a fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, and a trustee of the MacArthur Foundation. So without further ado, I give you JSB. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Great. So it's hard to know how to try to respond to everything that's been said in this wonderful conference that covered so many different slices of the problem. I'm going to uh, maybe cross-cut the silos in a different type of way, um, and I hope that it just helps to weave things together, and then, uh, John, your panel will, of course, stitch everything together. Um, so the, uh, the title of this, uh, in the spirit of the, uh, the core concept here of, of, of uh, what most of you put together, is a kind of a, how do we start thinking about a generative dance? a generative dance between us and our machines. Maybe new ways to learn, think, imagine. Maybe we actually need some new mindsets um, and perhaps even new lenses in which to really understand what in hell is really going on. Um, our past context, everyone here well understands. And uh, with you here, Joel, I, I, I hesitate to say anything, but um, I like to think about the 20th century as being basically uh, a push economy um, where the whole game in the corporate world was to take advantage of the incredible infrastructures uh, that, uh, that we had to um, look at how to build products where scalable efficiency was kind of the holy grail. In order to get scalable efficiency, what did you actually need to do? You need to be able to predict what people wanted, they wanted to build huge quantities of them. That led to also building hierarchical organizations. Um, organizational teams became the essence of organizational theory and business schools, and we, of course, strove for minimal variance. Pretty interesting, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> then I'm gonna claim the big shift happened. And the big shift is we moved from two or three centuries of basically major S-curves where basically there were um, moments of major punctuation like electrification, of which then at the end of that S-curve we went for 40, 50, 60 years, um, the things were relatively stable. Um, and we actually built institutional architectures, by the way, we built universities to live in this world of relative stability with brief moments, uh, but very seldom moments of major uh, uh, disruption. Um, and now, 
It's easy to say, and the whole basis of this conference is, in some sense, it's easy to say, it's almost a throwaway line, that now we have gone exponential. The sigmoid curve uh, may be out of keeping for the next 20 or 30, 40 years. A lot of my friends say, John, have you forgotten um, that Moore's Law doesn't generalize? By the way, a bunch of people in here that build silicon chips, like I do, it did. Um, we now build 3D chips. We can do all kinds of new ways to build this. This game is going to continue at least for another 20 years. Um, but actually, more realistically, what's really happening is we have now rapid, fast, punctuated, small punctuated evolutions. Almost every 18 months, something new is really happening that's kind of disruptive to some of us. Um, and in fact, if there's one thing that's pretty clear, is yesterday's best practices are rapidly becoming outmoded. Um, and I like to think about the fact that many of our institutional architectures, and even speaking epistemologically, perhaps our ways of knowing are also becoming outdated. Um, and I'm really struck by uh, this one quote from Kevin uh, in his recent book, The Inevitable. Uh, the cycle of obsolescence is accelerating. The average lifespan of a phone app is a mere 30 days. You won't have time to master anything before it's displaced. Yeah, uh, and you want to call that progress? <laughs> um, it's disruptive, but it sure makes a lot of our lives kind of crazy. Um, I think, though, that um, stepping back from that a moment, let's look at this thing a little bit more from a global perspective. I want to now look at this big shift through three lenses, or an operational lens, an epistemological lens having to do with how do we come to know, um, and an ontological lens. What does it mean to be in this world that we're talking about in the last two days? First, let's look into the simple part, because it touches a lot of things that all of us live day in and day out, the operational lens. I'm fond of saying, you know, um, when I grew up, which was a long time ago, uh, well, some people don't think I have yet grown up, but uh, um, that um, my father said to me, you know, John, think of your career as a steamship. You set course, and you just get grit, and you just plow through everything. And I said, you know, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, and as I kind of started to grow up more and more and came to Silicon Valley, albeit in the early mid-70s, um, you know, I said, I think I kind of like the idea of sailboats. A sailboat has a nice property, you know. You pick up the winds, you use forces around you, uh, you play with those, you move with them, and so on and so forth. Um, it's kind of an interesting model for the way we played the digital age. Um, and guess what, you know, those of us that sail a lot, you know, when you get really seriously blown off course, you do a really hard tack. And when it came to Silicon Valley, I learned that a hard tack is called pivoting. <laughs> so you pivot. <laughs> um, you know, the trouble is that no longer really captures where we are today. And my colleague and co-author of much of this work, Ann Pelham and Julian and I, like to think when we're now in a world I'm going to call a digitally networked age, which maybe is best characterized by white water rafting. Um, this whitewater world is increasingly fast, radically contingent, as we'll come back to, and hyper-connected. Um, now, I show this in case some of you don't do whitewater rafting, but, uh, but this is what it feels like. <laughs> is it what it's really like? <laughs> um, and the very interesting properties of what does it mean to be able to really thrive in this kind of white water world. Um, the catch here is in this white water world, let me just see what happened. Okay. Um, we're in an era in which kind of deepening individual expertise within a particular silo may no longer hack it. Most of us are brought up in saying our job 
It is to become masters of a silo and really conquer that. Um, but in this kind of a world, this network world, whitewater world, um, we are constantly, constantly embedded in knowledge flows. Um, and the real catch today is how do you participate in these knowledge flows? Understanding your own center of gravity, knowing what you can really do, that helps you rebalance yourself as you get knocked off course a little bit. Um, and how do you thrive in these kind of flows? What are the forms of participation you want to pick up? Uh, how do you now move from not just learning but creating in a way that, you know, when you create a lot of things, a lot of that is tacitly held. How does that actually work in this kind of age and so on and so forth? Um, but the key, a key, to being really successful if, for example, you're a whitewater kayaker or if you want to thrive in this new kind of world we're living in, um, is learning how to read contexts. We're moving from reading content to contexts in many ways. We're interpreting the flows on the surface for what they reveal beneath the surface. We're leveraging the currents, the disturbances, and the flows for amplified action, or some of us would prefer to call that a new form of agency because agency is key to what we need to think about. But you know, reading context ain't all that simple. Or as my colleague got me to change last night, isn't always simple. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, this really hit me. Um, I happened to be over in London the day before the Brexit vote, um, giving a talk with Deep Learning, by the way, uh, company, with Al Gore, for Al Gore's group. Um, and everyone sitting around his table, brilliant analysts, swore up and down that the Brexit vote would fail. Two days later, when I was again there, every one of those experts was explaining, of course, it went through. Um, and I said, you guys, did you realize what you were saying a day or two ago? You know, uh, no. Uh, I said, I reminded them, it was on tape. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to me that virtually all our really super fancy machine learning, that's why I was there, uh, and big data analytics tools and so on and so forth, we basically got that wrong. Um, in fact, I'm going to come back to that because it was this event here that when I came back to the United States, you know, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if Hillary and her team are using the same type of data analytics that we were using over there to predict it was obviously uh, would never fail, that they would, they would stay. Um, but we'll talk about that more in a moment. But I think the catch here in reading context is that data analytics doesn't do everything. Data analytics closely coupled to information visualization turns on knowing what questions to ask. It is how do you play with the data, in the data, to begin to understand what are the key questions. Said differently, very much in sympathy with several of the talks today and yesterday, data ain't information not beliefs, and it's not values. And all four of these dimensions get folded together. Um, and I think we heard, you know, Diana giving a very interesting talk around this notion. Speaking much more personally, in my own experience, um, having stepped down from Park in 2000, I'm going to come back to that in a different way in a moment, um, but uh, from 2000 to 2015, this was the things I was faced for throwing overboard almost everything I learned as a computer scientist, um, now having to really understand client, uh, to, to understanding cloud computing, having been one of the groups that actually built client server architectures, uh, how do we move from GPUs, how do we move to uh, no SQLs, um, uh, how do we take mobile first, dot, dot, seriously, all these things, last one was very, very tricky. Um, 
So that's kind of the 15 years I experienced, and I kind of went through that. I said, this is, this is really kind of curious world. I mean, how do I really pick up this stuff? How do I work in this world? How do I stay stable? And then the last year, which more or less captures, I think, what many of us in this room have experienced. In the last year, I've had to try to figure out how the hell this tensor product unit that Google has built actually works. How do these deep learning machines really work? How does blockchain completely transform the world economic scene in the fintech? Um, how do these distributed drones we heard about yesterday actually work? I mean, that's pure magic in a way. Um, and by the way, we didn't even get to talking about mixed reality. We talked about virtual reality, but not mixed reality. How does AR and VR come together? Those are just the things that we've been fa I've just had to face with in the last, last 12 months. And after seeing all that, then, wow, the game changed yet again. The uh, week before the famous match of Go, AlphaGo, um, I got a call from uh, not John Markoff, but other, another group. Uh, and he said, John, would you comment on what's going on? What do you think? And I said, they said, you know, I mean, um, AlphaGo has completely smashed the, the champion in Switzerland. And I said, give me a break. Switzerland? They only have five goal players. <laughs> I'm not going to take that that seriously. Uh, well, yet again, I was dead wrong. <laughs> I could not believe what happened here. Um, I'm going to claim the way this game played out, five games, this really was, in my book, a game changer. Uh, I never thought I would see something like that happen. Um, you know, given that, but perhaps um, given this kind of relentless pace of change and disruptions, one has to ask, is incremental learning, will it suffice any longer? Because we're all damn good at incremental learning. Maybe something else is now being called for. And in fact, one aspect of the big shift is how do we move not only from scalable efficiency to truly scalable learning, and this is as much a challenge for people in designing the workplaces of the future, because if every game is changing with a half-life of five years for most skill bases, um, that means almost all our learning is going to happen in workspaces in one form or another. How do we structure those so that those are actually looking at how to kind of create new knowledge for me as I create new knowledge for the institutions? Um, but it also is going to look at, I think, a much more challenging problem which organizational theorists don't think much about, um, and that is, what's the amount of unlearning that has to happen? How do you become a newbie? How do you thrive in being a newbie inside institutional architectures? Um, because that's what we basically are. Um, and most of the things I just showed you for the last year of my life, I became a hardcore newbie uh, and had to figure out what the hell was going on. Um, so I want to take a look at a couple of examples one of my heroes is Jack Hittery. Um, and one of his famous mantras is, John, you've got to understand, you've got to get more CEOs to understand. You've got to get out of your comfort zone because it's so easy to be comfortable in your silos. And, you know, John, uh, John Kling, um, you know, this also applies to the academy. I was bugging him earlier <laughs> about the silos of the academy. Um, you know, we're used to functioning very well inside the silos. Um, how do you get out of the comfort zone? Um, and lo and behold, what really struck me is how I actually met Jack. Um, um, Jack was a very successful, I mean, he still is, but I mean, a successful hedge fund trader, but he's done some things that actually affect all of us here in nothing having to do with hedge funds. He said, John, I have a protocol. I have a social protocol for how to get out of my comfort zone. He said, well, please tell me about it. And I happened to have been at an energy conference in Aspen at the time, and that's where I met Jack. Uh, Jack. He said, you know, John, I wanted now to pick up key insights into energy, um, and the, um, how the energy um, ecology system is going to evolve. So what do I do? The first day, I go to every lecture. The second day, I only sit outside by the coffee. And I start listening to the genres of interaction of the professional communities reflecting that 
particular practice. Because each practice has its own ways of talking. Each practice has its own ways of interacting. So I want to pick up those practices. And then the third day, I'm going to try to join those practices to see if I can ask really interesting questions when I picked up the first day relative to their genres of interaction. Um, and that's what he does year after year after year. I said, okay, Jack, I'm going to call back in six months and see what you've done. Well, the way some of us know Jack now is, A, he is the father of the uh, um, uh, cash for clunkers. He talked Obama into doing that after coming out of this conference. And he is the guy that talked Bloomberg into the hybrid cab in New York City. Um, so it's interesting that three days out of his comfort zone, he picked up enough skills and enough ideas how to make this kind of change. So he became a sense of agency through this whole sense of what you might call a term that uh, Anne and I love is orchestrating serendipity. It's not just luck. And I won't take you all through this, but some of you know that I actually study uh, champion surfers. Um, and I've been very interested in how champion surfers, surfing waves, not, not web. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, you know, where, how they circulate the globe every single year, picking up new ideas, but how they orchestrate, for example, going to certain events such as um, um, uh, kite skating, uh, waterboarding, uh, so, so on, uh, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to really pick up new types of ideas. Um, snowboarding, I meant. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, I'll get to that later. <laughs> As I was about to say what I do the rest now. But anyway, we'll stick with snowboarding. Uh, interesting ways to find adjacencies to enhance serendipity, uh, to get new ideas, to repurpose them in these spaces. Interesting way of thinking about a new form of innovation, which you know we're tremendous about. Joel, uh, in terms of how do we pick up other ideas and do a radical repurposing of those. Um, and I also want to say, let's not overlook one of the most powerful forms of picking up new skills, uh, a form I'm going to call of reverse mentoring. Reverse mentoring. Now, I became convinced of the power of this. Some of you have read some of these papers. Um, because when I stepped down from running Xerox Park, I was 60 years old. Um, and I decided I really wanted to master the gaming world. This is a scene from World of Warcraft. Uh, and so I said, you know, how do I quickly get up to speed in understanding the culture around the World of Warcraft? This is a massively multiplayer game of about 25 to 30 million people that play this game around the world. Um, it has, or it, these guys understand self-organizing for learning the likes of which you can't believe. Every night, 15,000 new ideas get created, and they get shared around the world, and then tried out, validated, and then put into action that night. Um, so J.C. Hertz, this 25-year-old kid, John, you know her, worked for the New York Times at that time. <laughs> um, she and I were at a talk, and I gave a talk uh, about games in general, and she said, you know, John, she came up to me after, she said, it's a fantastic talk but I can tell you, you don't know a damn thing about games. <laughs> and I said, yep, I think you're right. I kind of understand what they could be, but then she said, Look, are you willing to do an apprenticeship with me? See, you know, I'm 60 years old, you're 25. She said, yes, and to do an apprenticeship with me, you've got to fly to New York all the time, and you've got to do everything I say. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to hear this big power structure argument with me, okay? <laughs> um, and so I took her on for a year. I fly to New York, I went to museums doing assignments like that for her and so on and so forth. But it was part of my training. Uh, and by the end of that year, um, I was fully embedded in, uh, in, in, in this culture. Um, so in a funny sort of way, um, this idea of the endless newbie, the new fault for everyone, um, it does keep us humble. There's a certain sense of saying, you know, if you really want to take reverse mentoring seriously, there's a certain kind of humility. And in the academy, I really find that if we're really trying to jump silos in the academy, a certain kind of humility really helps there also. 
and also jumping fences between the academy and industry. But let's look at this um, not just operationally, let's start looking at this more epistemologically. How does the very notion of what knowledge and knowing comes to mean in this particular world? And I'm going to end on some ontological observations. Um, given this relentless pace of change, we must be willing, I'm going to claim, to regrind our conceptual lenses. Regrinding conceptual lenses is absolutely the hardest thing in the world to do. Uh, because everything we're seeing up to now has been framed by our lenses. So reframing these things are not trivial. I know we all are sick and tired of hearing this, but living in exponential times, in our global network age, we're now entering a world in which everything is densely interconnected, and many of our problems are actually wicked problems. That is to say they're complex, not just complicated. Said in a different way, we recognize that the world is one that is in the midst of a unique and fundamental change, as one that is radically contingent upon contexts that evolve, conditions that change, and multitude of interconnections that emerge, and we form in dynamic ways. When we try to pick anything out by itself, we find it attached to all kinds of other things in the universe. If you want to know why we're having so much trouble in the Middle East, every time we pick up a problem, we do not understand how it is tied to so many other things. Um, and I can say that for over, almost every major problem we're now attacking. In this world of wicked problems, there is no special sphere of environment. Um, there is no distinct lands of oil, no detached global economy, and no separate issues of public health. These are all kind of tied together. And in fact, at Rand Corporation, where I spend a fair amount of time with, with my colleague Ann, um, I have a mantra saying, if you have a wicked problem, do not send an engineer to solve it. The engineers are fantastic at finding optimal solutions. The wicked problems are going to morph as soon as you touch them. So what does it mean to solve? It means how do you work with them? How do you become part of them in a way? How do you understand and how do you modulate these types of things? Um, there's something quite different here. In fact, I'm fond of looking at the um, map um, made by the World Economic Forum of the linkages. Uh, they're connecting some of the major problems that they are currently attacking. These are, nothing is isolated. You attack one wicked problem, and it touches a bunch of others. And it's interesting to see they map out these connections each year to try to figure out how do we actually make progress on some of this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's interesting to look at how they've been evolving these maps of linkages of uh, wicked problems. And the catch is, somewhat like a catch-22, uh, these wicked problems is that you cannot learn about the problem without trying solutions. But every solution you try has lasting unattended consequences that are likely to spawn new wicked problems. Examples of wicked problems include global warming, financial crisis, terrorism, which is the area that I work in, uh, environmental design, homeless, and so on. Um, so, you know, Marsha, you talk about seeding the clouds, I forget what it was, you know, believe you me that you do that, you have all kinds of unintended consequences incredibly connected to those. How do we begin to understand these types of interconnections? There's something different going on here. Now how do we play with these? In fact, stepping back from that, I say we need new ways to move from mechanistic thinking to understand context and problems that evolve, sets of exchanges with complex feedback loops, think dynamic attractors, network affordances, network affordances and contextual propensities. These are the new things we need to think about as we start to attack these types of problems. From Karl Popper's terminology, we gotta start thinking clouds, not clocks. One of the problems we have as a culture is we take clouds and pretend they're clocks. To understand a clock, what do you do? 
You can take it apart. You can completely understand it. You can put it back together again. Um, a cloud is a dynamic system. It cannot be taken apart. A cloud you can only study as a whole. Now, yes, we have some tools for studying these complex holes, but that's kind of the basic approach. In terms of Josh Ramo Cooper, uh, Cooper Ramo, um, that maybe now perhaps this whitewater world may require a new sense, a seventh sense. This is his most recent book. A seventh sense that says, you know, now we know the senses we have for local topology. What is the sense we develop for a new kind of network topology that touches things we can't see in all kinds of interesting ways? Maybe this is part of the new mindset that we may need to understand many of the problems we had even been talking about today. The seventh sense is the ability to look at any object and see the way in which it is changed by connection, whether you are commanding an army, running a Fortune 500 company, planning a great work of art, or in fact, simply thinking about your child's education. That today is a wicked problem. Uh, and I want to argue what we really have, maybe, for many of the things we've been talking about. We have a crisis of imagination, an inability to see the way in which something or everything is changed by hyper connectivity. Now, from my point of view, I talked about the Brexit experience, and that got me to come back to the United States. And I started looking at some data, and I realized, you know these tweets that were going out around Brexit? If you actually deconstruct where those tweets come from, Over one-third of those tweets came from 1% of the sites. Said differently, those were machine-generated. Those were chatbots that had been programmed up to act as a way to persuade a set of people how to think or how to distribute false information. Came back to here. And we said, you know, I begin to wonder, because some of us are connected with Hillary's campaign, off the wall, uh, at arm's length, um, are we actually understanding what's going on in terms of the tweet farms, the chat boxes, the things that now are unleashing armies, armies of tweet bots whose sole purpose is to confuse us so much that we no longer know that there's any notion of truth anymore. And then, of course, how does the media figure out what's trending? And let me tell you, I know several of the people in, I mean, you know, in, the, in the Trump camp that know how to get things to trend, very, to, to, to trend very fast. From that, the media picks it up. And so we start to have an interesting feedback system. This is a different world. Um, that we're now playing in. And I think that is hard, you know, and I, I, I'm going to claim privately um, that I do not think that the Hillary's team began to understand how this radical war of disinformation in social media, driven by robots, um, softbots, chatbots, could do machine learning on figuring out what things were catching and blow it out again by reversing it, and so on and so forth. This is a new game. Um, so this is kind of what this complexity world is about, but it's also maybe more important to talk about what is the crisis of imagination to even be able to conceive of this. Um, that her team honestly did not. Um, and until I came back from Brexit, I never dreamed of this kind of thing myself. Uh, but this kind of crisis of imagination. Uh, and so what is our imagination? Well, we tend to think of maybe, maybe 
imagination is this artsy, fancy thing at the, over here on the, uh, at the edge of you know, free imagination. But no, imagination actually plays out across the entire cognitive spectrum in some very interesting, powerful ways. Our imagination helps close the gap between what is novel and what is known. It finds connections between things that are not obvious. It plays with boundaries. It lets thoughts and partial thoughts jump fences, which, by the way, our conscious mind is not that good at. It engages in sense breaking, not just sense making. If you ever wondered how Sherlock Holmes really worked? Um, and basically, the main reason that I threw it up here and why we got into this in the first place is the imagination may be the fundamental tool that helps us break the tyranny of the present. How do you kind of break free of where we are? Because if we think about how to improve something, is an incremental move from where we are. Is something else to be able to look out 20 years, really construct a fairly robust future vision of what that could be, and then do a reverse engineering on what might it take in terms of public policy programs, et cetera, to get there. Um, said slightly differently, it's not just an add-on. It's not just relevant for the domains of the arts and music. I think, and we think, it is fundamental to this networked age that we're talking about. In fact, to cultivate the imagination, I want to think about this in terms of a blended ontology, a blended ontology that actually works with Homo sapien, Homo faber, in terms of how I make things, and Homo ludens, how do I play with things? And please recognize that our cultures, cultures in general, evolve through Homo ludens. Homo ludens is a social activity where basically we construct rules, we play with those, and create norms, and so on and so forth. There's some very beautiful work that says culture emerges more from Homo ludens than Homo sapien. It's something we need to think more seriously about as we look at how we combine these three things. But I think this becomes especially interesting in the core of this conference. What might be the real moonshot of our time? Let's ask, instead of textplaining the future, we may need a form of radical humanism. What might that mean? The unique power of the human imagination comes in part from its ability to integrate opposing qualities like emotion and reason, curiosity and certainty. How do we take these opposites and let them blend in ways to see something different? I'm going to claim that this is going to become increasingly important as we tackle the kinds of problems that we've heard about these last two days. One kind of interesting kind of uh, shift, an you know, ontological shift, um, in a very simple way, is think about freestyle chess. Freestyle chess is you can play chess any way you want, um, except by the rule. I mean, you have to play by the rules. Um, kinds of competition now in freestyle chess is you take a moderately good chess player with a moderately good hacker who knows. Um, um, chess, um, you let the two of them work together, one with fantastic imagination and the other totally at home with hacking the systems to play out the consequences of that move. You put the two of them together and so far they beat systematically the world's best chess playing machines and the world's best chess players. There's something about the combination, but that combination, they have to know how to work together to do that. Um, if you actually look into the essence of some of the stuff we do with special forces, you often have a hacker always signed up to work very closely 
um, with one of the operatives in the field. How, do you, as the, how does the tool become much more uh, than just the sum of the two? How does a whole become much more of this? So it's interesting to say, um, how do we begin to understand, um, it's almost like a new kind of imagination that lets these two minds start to merge, that produces something that is actually, to many of us, simply shocking. I mean, this the good chess player here is 1600. Any of us in this room play chess? I mean, 1600 is nothing to write home about. Uh, uh, what's the computer that this other guy uses? Uh, it's basically a, a high quality desktop machine. Okay? Put the two together, game over. Once they know how to really work together uh, and how this whole scheme builds on each other. Um, and in fact, I think the here, the essence here is. And we talked a little bit about this kind of the essence of AI, IA. What is this new blended epistemology? And let me go back to this on imagination. What have we heard? What have we heard today and yesterday? Basically, we got Homo sapien, and look at the way that Watson was advising, as we heard yesterday, um, in the boardroom on complex questions of an acquisition. Ordinarily, you would pass that out to a research assistant, uh, as the uh, Watson guy said, and a week later, you get back an answer. Now, basically two minutes later, you get back an answer. What starts to happen? A new kind of conversation is enabled. Because maybe the game is how do you empower this type of conversation, very much like I was talking about in freestyle chess. Homo Faber, think about how now can we actually build robots to build walls with bricks. Um, you can do things that way. They were almost unthinkable and get the wall built almost immediately. Um, you also saw the BIM stuff being talked about yesterday as well. Um, and of course, the Homo Ludens is interesting in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the goal game. In fact, it's interesting to, uh, I'm trying to get the reference for it this morning, um, but um, Lee, the, 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 um, the Go champion, um, since he went up against AlphaGo, has never lost another Go game. Um, so from that shocking move that he made, um, that the alpha goal made that he didn't know how to respond to. He learned a hell of a lot from that. Now, that's completely anecdotal. Um, it's something we want to be able to explore more. But it's kind of interesting how now this blended ontology provides maybe new ways of being. New ways of being. But yes, there are some serious questions here. Going back. The infrastructure we build over the next five years will redefine mankind. That is kind of a bold statement. Uh, um, uttered by Chris uh, Emerson, who heads, who not any longer, who headed, right, the Google self-driving car. Um, but let's look at this quickly. I mean, I don't want to take you all through how these autonomous, uh, how the deep learning system right here is working. But what's really happening here is this system has picked up um, a bicycle and is trying to, to infer a pattern of how that bicyclist, bicyclist is moving in order to be able to predict how stable is that bicyclist to know how much leeway to provide and so on and so forth. Um, the, um, so that's one of the patterns. It is now trying to learn in real time is watching this thing go. Um, uh, it also builds complex patterns. <laughs> I won't even go into what's going on there. Um, but there's something interesting. All of us in the anthropology are going to understand this deeply. Um, not everything fits patterns. This happened in Mountain View. 
This is a little Google car running around. And lo and behold, what happens? Out in front of it is a wheelchair. A uh, lady in the wheelchair driving across the road. Um, surprising? Well, but yeah, surprising because what is this lady doing? If you look very closely, the lady is actually chasing a duck. <laughs> And so the lady is actually starts going like this out in the middle of the road. Now, of course, um, Mountain View, what do you expect? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's an interesting example of how a deeply unexpected event, you know, something that's you know, in a radically contingent world, the only thing to expect is the unexpected. Uh, and that says some very interesting issues to us. So how do we handle these types of problems? I won't bore you with kind of this, but um, there's a lot of us interested in how do you know if algorithms are biased in some way or another. It's very interesting, you know, people keep talking about have we programmed up these machines to be biased. But the curious thing in deep learning systems, we don't program them. We curate them. Um, so, or mentor them in curious sorts of ways. This is a different game a game that I was completely unprepared for. I thought I would write, because my PhD was in, in this area, I mean, in, in, in machine learning in the early days with John Holland. Um, how, does, you know, how do these things work with no programming? Um, but only through these massive databases. But those massive databases have patterns. Interesting question. You know, how do we know that those databases have biases that are, in fact, kind of almost would lead to patterns that are illegal today. I became very interested in this because of being on various boards of directors. Um, it's an interesting question of our, of our corporations are actually being driven by more and more of these algorithms. Where does fiduciary responsibility actually lie? What are these things actually? So, um, you know, and go one step further, you know, what is the ethics that has been inferred from the data we have provided it? The ethics does not lie in the programs. The ethics lies in the patterns that this system has assimilated. It led to a, a wonderful cartoon uh, in uh, the New Yorker. Um, here, somebody trying to figure out, is this Google, what is the ethical basis of this Google machine? Um, what are the biases of this Google machine? Um, and the, um, you, know, you think about it, you know, uh, I'm on the Amazon board. I have to, you know, oversee the fiduciary responsibility of the, all the machine learning algorithms that run that company. How do you begin to understand what those things really are doing? Um, does anybody understand what these things are really doing? Uh, and so on and so forth. How do you probe these things? A whole new set of questions. Um, and this is the one that I love most, is here is somebody who's been denied a loan. Um, has this machine this actually reinvented redlining? It looked at a whole bunch of data, and there's no, nothing in the program that says it's redlining, but it picked up this pattern, which is equivalent to if it had been programmed to be redlined. Um, so the catch now, going back to the essence of closing down my, my point here, um, is biases may not just lie in the algorithms, which everybody talks about, but rather in the social awarenesses of how data is collected and curated. Interesting challenge we have. Maybe there is a blind spot in AI. Um, it's been recently reported uh, by Kate Offord in, in Nature. A social systems analysis is needed that dwells in philosophy, law, sociology, anthropology, blah, 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 um, especially with respect to the curation of data used to train these deep learning systems. Perhaps only by asking broader questions about the impacts of AI can we generate a more holistic and integrated understanding of even how to do this kind of investigation. And one last comment. Many of the new infrastructural uh, innovations exhibit a kind of asymmetry, an asymmetry of power an asymmetry between develop, those of us that develop the technology, um, that create the protocols and the gateways, and everyone else's futures that will be shaped by it. 
which is some of the things that are being discussed earlier. Um, new capabilities, new conflicts, new challenges, and new opportunities. But how do we begin to understand these things? Because they're not even embedded in the algorithms themselves or the institution, or in this particular case, they may very well be embedded in the, the way that the institutions themselves do function. Um, and now you begin to see the things that are happening with like, Google in Europe and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so it's very interesting issues about this new net digital network world. So let me kind of wind down by saying like, you know, we really do have something very special going on that is truly disrupting us. If you look at this sequence of technologies we have here, all been relatively quickly developed. Um, and the, what's interesting to me, uh, getting back to your point, Joel, these things feed on themselves um, in their own interesting way, um, amplifying the capabilities of each and amplifying the innovations that come from them. Um, so somehow, you know what Chris said, and when I first came across, I said, come on, Chris, you crazy? Uh, now, you know, six months later, I'm not so sure. There's a fairly deep question lurking under this, I think. So with that, thank you. <laughs> I'll throw it to you. No. <laughs> um, first, let me say this was an absolutely brilliant talk that I desperately love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I say that as a humanist, um, which uh, says a great deal about your clarity and um, understanding. Um, I would like to say first that uh, I saw an absolutely beautiful film that some of you may have seen uh, a couple of days ago entitled Arrival. And it seems to me that um, it is an awfully good rendering of your talk. And I say that because um, uh, it is about um, some aliens who drop down on, on the planet in seven places in a weird form and everybody's wondering what they're doing there and some colonel from uh, the government um, uh, arrives to get uh, a, a linguist at a university to help try to Decode. understand their language. Um, while she's on the helicopter to go there, there's another man there. And he looks at her and he says, um, someone once said that um, nothing in the world begins without language. And that was such a beautiful thing. And um, it turns out that it's from her book. Uh, uh, um, a moment later, however, he offers another possibility. He says, of course, in my mind, nothing in the world begins without science. And what happens in the film, uh, I think, um, as these two work together, and there's a moment where she will say, I sometimes think nothing happened except what happened between Ian and me. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, they, they get near the aliens, and there's, all, there's some technology in the background. There are boxes of uh, their... Uh, 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 meet, uh, some scientist needs to help me, um, uh, <laughs> cameras, <laughs> um, various things. And there's also uh, a cage with a canary. And all that technology um, throughout the film will seem incredibly dead, especially next to the canary. And what will happen will be that the imaginative um, art of the of Louise combined with the incredible mathematics of Ian will do something astonishing, and um, uh, 
I, I bring this up because I love the way your lecture ends with the imagination. Um, and I want to chide you about one thing, however. Uh, and, that, uh, and that is that um, uh, for me, uh, there is an incredible, um, uh, there are incredible opportunities where science and art to come together. And that art is not the, right. just the flimsy thing over there, but that the imaginative um, realm you're talking about uh, uh, and, and its uh, possibilities. Right. So uh, anyway, I must say once again, thank you and, and do see uh, arrival. Thank you. The, um, you know, in fact, um, you know, I, a key part of what made Park so powerful was bringing artists and uh, in one-on-one -on -one relationship with some of our key scientists working together. But to me, the real purpose of art is how to see differently. And we don't know how to see. And if you take this frame breaking seriously, what, crafting new lenses requires seeing differently. So the key to innovation, the key to Steve Jobs, by the way, is he saw differently, beginning and end of story. Um, you know, and he's more of a humanist than he is a technologist, believe you me. I mean, <laughs> he would probably agree if he were here today. So I just, I think it's kind of a simple question, but it was kind of coming up again and again as I was listening to it. And I, I by the way, I love the talk. Fantastic. Um, how can we, so what you're saying is we have to be better at being humanists rather than technologists. And I've experienced that in the Valley, and I think the Valley is oftentimes too technologist. But how do we make it so? How do we make it so that we are humanists and not technologists? What would be a first step to, I guess, allowing more and more people to realize that's the right way to go? I, I mean, first, I wouldn't say you, you have to be a humanist versus a technologist. Maybe we could actually figure out an interesting way to combine them. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, you know, part of why the middle part of that talk is talking about how do you get out of your own comfort zone? Um, you know, how do you actually, um, um, you know, visit and engage in operations that don't seem very normal? Uh, and, you know, even, for example, how do you learn to take a simple course on how to sketch? I mean, you know, in the corporate world and in the research world, the ability to sketch something turns out to be an amazingly powerful way to communicate. Um, but also look for the opportunity of, of thinking how do you build, you know, the power of two you know, around a boundary object uh, that actually have two communities of practice, you and the artist, or you and the humanist working together. Around that boundary object, a lot of the abilities to communicate much more effectively gets unleashed. Otherwise, you talk through each other. And so I can show you, you know, a lot of ideas about now how to jump bridges or jump solids, uh, uh, silos and to do something like this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, towards the end, you mentioned something about the uh, deep learning algorithms being black boxes and how they learn biases and how they uh, continue carrying them on. So what, what, what do you think is the best way to uh, go about this? Because people are increasingly depending on these systems now, companies and stuff. So right. The, how to decode, how to, on, how to do, for, let me call it in a technical term, how to do forensic analysis on machine learning is an incredibly interesting topic. <laughs> um, the, um, there's a, um, there's a group at UC Irvine, and it's called LIME, L-I-M-E, and um, I wish I could now remember the, uh, uh, what those things stand for, but it's, it's interesting how you can deconstruct um, an image to see when it starts to go astray in the machine learning system. It starts to give you inner insights to what some of the intermediate layers of that machine learning are doing. Um, if you look at um, a beautiful paper of how electric sheep's dream is a Google paper, you see kind of how you can go in and you can overly amp up one of the layers of the deep learning network or even a section of it and actually begin to see how that starts to distort things. 
And when that gives you some sense of kind of what different parts of that, of that 20 or 30 or 40 layer network are really doing things. Um, but believe you me, this is, this is a virgin territory. I only know a dozen people or so that are working on it at the moment. Um, and it's, it, we're going to have to come to understanding of it because you can't have, you know, John, public policy programs if you can't understand what underlies, I mean, we keep talking about transparency and algorithms. That's, that's only a tiny part of the problem. Uh, the transparency has, I mean, the real challenge is what is implicit in the patterns of our data. And when you can actually, you know, run, you know, 100 million examples through, it's really hard to tell what this machine has figured out for itself. Uh, so I think it's, this is going to be in the next year or two a very hot topic, I think. Thank you very much for a great explanation. You know, in the policy world, you, you, you mentioned we have uh, these wicked problems, and mo most of our problems are wicked problems in policy. Homelessness, mental illness, unemployment, social um, payments, um, fiscal insolvency, all of these other things. Uh, and uh, I agree with you that the solution lies in the ability to step outside our way of thinking and try to reframe and try to find these completely different solutions, which we have never considered before. But the, what happens most of, the, uh, uh, most of the time, the reality is that we still tend to think in us versus them terms, and it's a zero-sum game. If I win, then somebody else is loses, right. and if, I, if I'm giving something away. So we are doing, um, so in your practice, in your experience, what have you seen as successful ways to overcome this? And in addition to this, this is kind of how we humans operate, and we're doing oftentimes a horrible job at being humans. So we want to be more humans than technologists, but we have not perfected that, at least in the policy sphere, at least most of the time. Can you comment on that? Well, as you obviously know, homelessness is a serious problem because there's been almost no progress made solving it. Um, the, um, uh, and it happens to be one of the new problems that my colleague is starting to look at um, relative to some of these techniques. I, I, think, it's, I think it's important to, um, to realize that we don't tend to think about what's the roles of identity and how do we actually listen to the different sub-tribes that make up the homelessness. And so it's too easy to go in there with our sense of identity and try to understand them. Um, and that's exactly the mistake we're making in terrorism or then trying to understand ISIS, et cetera, et cetera. Pardon me? Yeah. We're going in with a toolkit. We're going in with a toolkit that biases the way we think the solution should go. Yeah. As opposed to ways to amplify our ability to hear something we're not prepared to hear. And that's kind of the catch. This is the crisis of imagination. How do we, how do we hear something we're not prepared to hear already? And how do we make sense out of it? We're closing the gap between what's being said and, you know, and what we hear. And this is this whole key notion in one of my slides, um, on one of our slides, is how do we break sense before we make sense? How do you, instead of trying to force fit this thing into a frame we already know, how do you back up and say, no, 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 maybe, maybe there are weak signals here that we haven't put together in the right sort of way that we now ought to go back and rethink this game or re-listen to this game, yeah. Right, right. Well, but one of the things we wanted to understand is how to actually construct a new generation of, of political uh, public policy people that understand what is deep listening really about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask a question that I don't actually believe in, but it's because I've been stuck in this situation and curious how you would respond instead. When I was, uh, several years ago, it was the first time this, occur this happened to me where I was spending some time at Google and I was hanging out with the brain team and I was told, what, what's your problem? We've gotten to a point where we'll just never understand the complexity of our models anymore and that's just the way it is. Why are you even trying to poke into them? And I found this coming out of sort of a generative Bayesian standpoint, kind of really frustrating or whatnot. But I, it's not that I believe that comment, but it, it, does, it does indicate 
something about the culture that's largely evolved around deep learning in particular. And so is it up to policy to basically say, no, you have to have interpretability if you're gonna use these things downstream? Or where, where, where does the influence come that pushes back against that kind of, I'll just build an arbitrarily complex thing and I'm not really that concerned? Um, have you ever heard about adolescence? That's Google. <laughs> the, yeah. Um, <laughs> don't tweet that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but, but the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we're all growing up. I mean, like, it's not, you know, we have to understand, and that's not a socially acceptable answer anymore. Um, the, uh, but how to put bounds on what we can understand. But, you know, but basically more and more of the AI groups, and, and by the way, Google is doing this as much as anybody else, are finding ways to get almost um, in theories of abduction, how do I construct the best story that actually explains the conclusion? Because I have to have a, con I have to have a description that's believable and understandable at the same time. So we got a now interesting situation going. If I actually explained everything going on, you know, three years later, you'd still be, you know, listening. Uh, I mean, no, you'd be bored. <laughs> but, but, uh, so I mean, I, I think we have a, you know, a challenge of abduction as a new form of, 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 of inference that we have to look at too. And the people looking at the forensic analysis are, are thinking about that. I don't know who in Google is doing it right now, but. I'll guarantee you that if they aren't doing it, they will be doing it. But it has to come, it, it, the answer seems like you're saying this is something that's going to come from within the community, not necessarily external to it. So. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. I'm wondering if whether uh, what you're suggesting as something new that we need is in fact something that's very old. Um, we seem to be living in a time where uh, we're more and more focusing on STEM, uh, education. Uh, colleges are uh, focusing on that and everybody's getting an MBA and the key word for universities is entrepreneurial and now it's working its way down until relatively recently in academic history um, there was there was another approach because partly because there was less information to deal with, but uh, there was broad education. You can call it a liberal arts education. They didn't call it anything if you went back far enough. It was just called education, and it included a wide range of subjects that now that people get to choose what they're going to study in school as a result of changes made in the 60s, uh, people don't necessarily get anymore. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about, about education at any level. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it, of course, it's a hugely important topic. Um, and by the way, STEAM does not answer the question either <laughs> uh, by adding art in the middle of STEM. Uh, the, um, you know, I think we, I think, we, we have really hurt ourselves by pushing out music, art, uh, dance, uh, kinetic things as well. Um, so I mean, I think that, um, you know, to me, the ability to see differently is a key to almost everything. <laughs> um, and I get that as much from the arts as anything else. Uh, but one of the questions is how do you become, how do you create a sense of curiosity in our students? Because you're never gonna jump silos jump fences if you don't have curiosity. So I mean, I think that that's a, a real issue. And I think we have become so focused on um, a ridiculously narrow part of education um, that I think we're, you know, we're definitely hurting ourselves. Um, I, I'm, I, um, I'm connected with a very bizarre polytech school uh, in, um, in engineering. But the first year, um, all students take one semester of life drawing, one semester um, of sculpture. I don't mean with computers, I mean with clay. Uh, and one semester of sound sculpture. Because if you can sculpture sound, that creates emotion, dot, dot, dot. It turns out to be a lot of 
things to learn there. And it's so surprising to me to see a new kind of program coming along that just talks to students who want to go into the technical fields but are not really used to um, this, kind of, uh, uh, this kind of training. Uh, and you know, it didn't do that all that well in, uh, uh, in, in some of the classical forms. So I mean, I think we've got to really blow open this game. Um, and I think that's part of our responsibilities here to uh, say, hey, look at, you know, uh, we got things to, um, to learn, by the way, from Finland. <laughs> uh, uh, but we also have, you know, we got to be a hell of a lot more experimental. But I mean, curiosity is the game. And learning how to see differently is the game. And if you can do that, we have infinite set of resources that are accessible, uh, you know, with the maker spaces and the web and so on and so forth. I mean, we are, you know, we are rich in resources. Uh, in ways that when I grew up was unthinkable. Last question? Maybe. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Thanks. You want to uh, know about macroeconomics? No, no. <laughs> you know, we'll take that one okay, later okay, because yeah. I want to. I want to come with another suggestion and, and get your sure. thoughts on it. So, how about we define innovation as the introduction of a new narrative? And that we see technology as the enabler of the narrative, and we see the business model as the sustainer, basically, because right. the the argument for this is that that you know, uh, innovation introduces a new way of relating, and we understand relation by narrative. And I think you know that 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 will kind of put the story at the middle rather than the yeah. technology. No, I, 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 I love it. Um, you know, I would combine the narrative with the ability to sketch. I mean, because, um, you know, so, but yes, I mean, it's, that, that's the right kind of spirit. Yeah, um, so th th this would lead to then that maybe with the steam and so one should include comparative literature. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't stop there either, by the way. But, okay, thank you very much.